Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. I want to thank you for being here today and welcome to our Tiger Talk, our actual last Tiger Talk for the spring 2024 semester. Can't believe it. We're at the end and uh, we have some great information for you today, a wonderful guest, and we are excited about the information that she's going to be able to share with you all uh, surrounding supporting your students' mental health and wellness. But before we get started, I do want to remind you to please mute your microphone and feel free to tap your to type your question in the chat at any time if you have a question and we will make sure that our expert here, our campus partner answers that question or if it's something that we can answer, we can answer your question. Um, if you're watching this later on YouTube and you have a question, you can feel free to email us at parents at memphis.edu with your question and we'll make sure that we get that answered as well. So we'll go ahead and move forward here. Um, like I said, this is our last Tiger Talk of the spring 2024 semester, and we have our Student Health and Counseling Center here with us. We have Ms. Tiffany Burke Sanders here with us to talk about supporting your students' mental health and wellness. And she's got some wonderful information that I'm sure is going to help all of us be able to support our students and um, understand what that means. So we'll go ahead and get started with introductions. My name is Heather Hampton. I am the Senior Coordinator for Parent and Family Services. Hello, everyone. My name is Kate Forbes, and I am the Coordinator for Parent and Family Services. All right, of course, I'm Tiffany Burke Sanders. I'm a wellness engagement counselor and also uh, a social worker in student health and counseling services. All right, so before we get started, um, Tiffany's got some wonderful information, but we want to ask her uh, just a, a question to get to know her a little bit better. So, Tiffany, what would you say is your favorite season? So, we've got spring, summer, fall, winter. What's your favorite? Um, Spring or fall, preferably spring. Okay. Um, Southern girl my whole life and do not like the heat. <laughs> I also do not like the cold. So I like that nice in between kind of cool, but not too cool weather. Yes. This spring is perfect easily for me. Yeah, I, I could see that too. I almost thought about it and thought I would be a, a, a summer person. My birthday is in the summer, but I don't like the heat. I don't like being outside in the heat. So Memphis oh. summers are not fun. <laughs> Memphis summers are really hot. If you're watching this and your your students coming from out of state or from a northern state where it's not too hot, uh, make sure you prepare their minds to to be in this heat and uh, make sure they have what they need as well as far as clothing and fans and yes. things like that. So, um, yes. so we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, and advance the slide here. So we'll give the floor over to Ms. Tiffany. And like I said, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat and we'll make sure she answers those questions as we go. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, like I said, my name is Tiffany um, and I'm here to talk to you about mental health and how it pertains to your student. Um, I will say the word student a lot and not your child, not your kid, because we're they're students to us. And so that's where we, um, well, that's where we will go. It's called them the students. Um, and the, the presentation is stigma free because there's so much stigma surrounding mental health that it prevents or creates barriers for people to seek help. help. And so we want to try and eliminate that barrier um, and encourage our students here to seek help. And as we get towards the end of the presentation, you will see how they can get help through the Student Health and Counseling Center. So we're gonna do a stigma-free presentation and encourage you to keep an open mind um, and help break down those barriers that we call stigma that keeps people from getting help. Next slide. All right, so this right here is a little, um, did you know, just basically some facts about mental health. Um, one in five people experience a mental health condition and that's a that's a that's a large number. So if you imagine five people in the room, at least one of them may have experienced a mental health condition, and that can range from a multitude of things, from depression to um, schizoaffective disorder. So there are a lot of things that fall under the mental health condition that people experience. Um, more than seventy-five percent of mental health conditions begin before the age of twenty-four, 
um, which is why college is a crucial time and why we want you to understand how your student can get help um, and the services that are available to them. Most of our um, students fall within this age range. So we have a, a heavy job here of keeping out and observing those things. Um, anxiety is a top presenting concern among college students, uh, which is about 41%, followed by depression and relationship problems. And while half of college students uh, would encourage a friend to seek help for emotional issues, fewer than one fourth would seek help for themselves. And that's the question why. Um, one of the things we just did that Healthy Mind survey, and we found those numbers to be pretty accurate even for our, camp our campus. We know that students are aware of the services here, but not all of them seek the services that they need. All right, so what is stigma? Um, so stigma is a negative attitude and inaccurate beliefs about people who have mental health conditions. I know we've probably heard the word stigma surrounding people who have um, substance abuse, um, substance use disorders. Um, they get a lot. Of, it's a lot of stigma surrounding that particular disorder, but it can it can affect all mental health conditions. Um, from the one of the things that goes uh, that we notice now is a lot of people take um, mental health terms and use them just randomly. You'll hear people say, "Oh, the weather bipolar." Oh, she's just crazy, um, and things like that, and that creates that stigma that stops people from receiving help. Um, and so that's one of the things that we're trying to do here. Another thing stigma stems, stems from myths, inaccurate perception, and lack of information, um, which is something that we will address um, throughout this presentation. But there have always been things when you hear myths, all the old folk tales and the different things that have just kind of carried on through generation and the stories. And it's like, where do these things come from? Um, and yeah, it may have been some of your grand, great grandparents said and passed it down, but now we know that um, passing those myths down, passing those stories down, creating those inaccurate perceptions about mental health conditions, it's, call, it's hurting people more than it's helping. It's causing so many people not to um, seek treatment and, and shaming obviously is a big one. So especially in certain populations and certain community, it, it is shame. So it does prevent a lot of people from seeking help. You can go ahead. So why is it a problem? Obviously it prevents people from seeking treatment, right? Um, because if there's stigma surrounding something or there's a negative connotation around something, most people are not gonna go seek help because they don't wanna be labeled. They don't wanna be seen as this negative you know, thing that people have talked about. So it does prevent people from seeking treatment. Um, it prevents people from getting the needed support from family and friends. If I know my family and friends has this idea of what depression is and they make fun of it or they make it sounds so horrible. Am I going to talk to them? No, I'm not. If, if I'm a student and I know how my parents feel about depression or anxiety, they say, oh, you're too young for anxiety. Oh, you don't have anything to worry about. You don't have any problems. Am I going to share that with them? Probably not. Um, so it stops them from getting that support they need from family and friends. Um, it can lead to discrimination in jobs, education, housing, and even medical care. A lot of people don't want to seek treatment because they don't want to get a diagnosis because they're afraid they won't get the job. Um, and so that's another barrier. Um, prejudice and discrimination are experienced by nine-tenths of people with a mental health condition. It's very prevalent. People are still um, having to face these things. These are truths, uh, truths for a lot of people. Um, and for many experiences, stigma is worse than living with a mental health condition. Um, it comes from many sources and can cause people to be ashamed of their mental health condition and seek help. Again, if I feel like I may have anxiety, if I feel like I may have depression and my family is not helpful, no, I'm not going to get better. Um, I can I can be seeking treatment on campus, but I have to go home for the summer. And so they have to deal with that, what comes with that, being at home, being around people who don't understand or don't respect the fact that mental health conditions are real. Um, so yes, it can be worse than living with the actual mental health condition. You can go to the next slide. Um, so what we're going to do here is talk about how we can be stigma free, um, learning more things that you can do is learn more about mental health. Let's even see the person, not the condition and take action. And so what we mean by that is like making it a priority to learn about different mental health conditions, mental health challenges. Oh, excuse me. Um, and learn why using various terms is not 
is not helpful. Using uh, mental health terms just at random, just to describe something or making it a negative thing is not helpful. Um, see the person, not the condition. Basically, knowing that the condition or the mental health challenge does not define the person. Um, and taking action, being more deliberate. I keep grabbing my mouse like I'm doing that. Being more deliberate about um, understanding what you can do to make a difference. Next slide. Okay. So when we talk about learning more about mental health, um, this is what we mean. Doing your research. Um, we have links available where you can learn more in things about mental health, um, where you can get more understanding, more information about various mental health conditions um, and what it means. Also knowing some common warning signs of different things. Uh, when I say make it a priority to learn more, I mean, doing your due diligence to understand how mental health affects different people, um, how your student may be affected, knowing, looking at, looking and learning about signs um, that they may be experiencing a mental health challenge. This is not an exhaustive list. There are a lot of things that could be uh, warning signs. But when I read these, I want you to think, know your child. You know your student, I think I didn't like, you know your student better than than I know your student as one of the therapists in the counseling center. So you will notice these things. You'll understand these things. You'll know when something is different. Um, so some of the warning signs may be feeling very sad or withdrawn for more than two weeks. If your student's away from um, school, you may not see them all the time, but you may talk to them quite often. I know a lot of students do FaceTime now because they got all the fancy phones. They can FaceTime each other, video chat. Um, and so it's important to, to, to notice when there's a difference in your student. Uh, notice that they are not as excited as they were. Um, notice if um, they're being more withdrawn. They're telling you, oh, yeah, I was going to the organization. I stopped without a reason. Like they just stopped going to whatever organization they joined with no reason given and and just kind of take a concern about that. Sometimes it's just that organization wasn't from there, right? For them. But sometimes it may be other things, reason why they're withdrawn from different things. Uh, no signs about trying to harm or kill oneself or making plans to do so. Um, we offer we offer quite a few um, courses here on campus. I'll get some later on. But one of the courses that we offer is Talk Saves Lives, which is it's like it's a suicide prevention um certification that we offer here on campus for faculty, staff, and students. Um, but it shows, it teaches people how to recognize sign, warning signs of suicide, um, but also prepares them to ask the question, um, are you thinking about killing yourself? Are you thinking about suicide? And I know as a parent, that's a hard question to ask your child because you don't know what their response may be. Um, and so the trainings, it will teach you on how to respond in those situations. So I encourage you to find trainings. Um, if you're here on campus and you see that we're off, off in the Talk Saves Lives or Mental First Aid training, sign up for it. Um, so that way you can learn how to address your student, how to recognize the signs, um, and how to respond if the answer is yes. Um, other signs, severe out of control, risk-taking behaviors that can cause self harm to self or others. If you know your student has never been the one to be a risk taker, um, get involved in risky behaviors or do different things like that, and all of a sudden they are, you may wanna stop and have that conversation. So what's going on? Um, what has changed? Has anything changed? One of the things I always encourage parents when I do the parent talk is talk to your child, talk to your student. I'm trying to get used to saying student. Talk to your student, know your student, be comfortable with asking the question, what, what's been going on? So what's happened? Um, you know, I know you were gearing up this big test. Now all of a sudden you're just like, ah, whatever. You know, what, what changed that attitude? Um, if they're doing things and getting report, I know it's not like high school where the principal calls you and say, hey, your student is doing this. Um, but if you have the little, the little link to look at their grades, you know something's wrong with their grades, or if they're telling you, you know, hey, yeah, I'm making all these or else now. Investigate. Ask questions. Um, we'll talk about a little later on how you can reach out to the school to get your, your student help. But yeah, ask questions. Talk to them. Um, different other things that, you know, things that you may not even know that they are um, dealing with because 
it may be something that you have to be here to see. For example, repeated use of drugs or alcohol. You may have no clue that your student is using drugs or alcohol. That's that's kind of a hard one when you're a far away parent. Um, so again, that's why it's also good to have those conversations with your student. Ask them, you know, so hey, I know you're probably going to parties or you know, what's going on at those parties? What what's what's happening? What are you doing? Um, and if you're close with their friends, you know, have conference calls. So, you know, just talk to the group, say what's going on, what y'all been up to. Um, the key here is you have to make an effort to A, learn more about mental health challenges, learn some warning signs, and two, be in communication with your student to see if you notice any of these things or if any of these things are taking place. Um, so that way you can reach out and get your student help sooner. The earlier you intervene, the better chances that your student will be okay. That's the next slide. All right, so see the person and not the condition. Language matters. Um, I always tell people, I, I, I did a, um, a presentation about stigma when it comes to substance use disorder. And one of the biggest things that when you think about substance use disorder, everybody wants to say, oh, crackhead, oh, he's a drug addict, or, you know, this. And I always ask the question, why is it so hard to just call a person by their name? <laughs> why do you have to describe them or label them? It's really not that hard. Um, so language matters. Um, and so people with mental health condition, opposed to saying the mentally ill, they are not the condition. And so using terms like the person with depression or the person with bipolar is a lot different than saying, the, oh, the bipolar, uh, the, you know, the bipolar person, that bipolar girl, or, you know, the mentally, the one with the mental illness, you know, it's it's a whole lot better and we can make changes if we change the way we talk, if we change the way we say things. And I know it won't happen overnight. I know that some people are just used to this. They've said it their whole life. It's one of the things with the drug epidemic um, that we found is so many people have always said, oh, the drug addict or the crack. It. It's so easy and so natural that it's hard for them to change. But I just encourage people. Uh, matter of fact, I challenge people to change that wording to say, oh, you know, Miss Smith with the condition because she's not or he is, they're not the condition they have a condition and so there's a huge difference um and avoid using words like crazy we thought the word crazy just it has it's gained such a negative connotation like try not to say things like that um try to be careful what you're saying um another one we do is uh bipolar psychotic OCD just to describe a person's behavior it's reinforcing a stereotype right if you see somebody clean up the house, oh, they're OCD. You don't know that. You haven't diagnosed them. You don't know that medical condition. Like, you have no idea what they are. And plus, OCD has a whole lot more behaviors than just they clean a lot. A whole lot more. It has nothing to do with cleaning. Um, and so, but we've used these terms historically to describe people in a negative way that it has created this negative, negative connotation and this negative stereotype um, that's hard for people who may be experiencing symptoms of bipolar disorder or OCD from getting help because it has such a negative um, stereotype connected to it. And connection matters. Talking about the value of self-care and mental health openly, um, staying connected and continuing engagement. Um, this is, again, going back to talking to your student. Um, and we're going to get to it a little bit later on about the self-care aspect of it. And talking to your student about mental health, being open, being honest. Um, I know it's sometimes hard as parents to have that conversation if we have a mental health challenge. Um, but sometimes it's helpful to our student so they don't feel alone. You know, if you do um, deal with anxiety or panic attacks and sharing it with your student may allow them to open up and say, yeah, I, I've been experiencing something too. I know something's been going on. So making that connection with your student, being open and, and continuing to have that engagement with your student can also be helpful. Next slide. Um, and then taking action. Um, basically, speak, speak with respect and compassion when you talk to others about mental health. The way you talk to other people, your student hears that. So if you're using these negative wording, if you're um, using these stereotypes to others, your student hears that and they know that's how you feel about mental health challenges. And again, if I know my family feels that way, am I going to talk to them and be open with them? No, I'm not. 
Um, so when you're talking to other people um, about mental health challenges, be compassionate, be respectful, um, encourage interpersonal responsibility and coping skills um, through life skills. So teaching your, your child, your student about, you know, goal setting, problem solving, conflict and uh, resolution. On top of that, letting your student know here at the University of Memphis, we literally offer presentations about all of these things. Um, the Student Health and Counseling Center has presentations um, that help students with uh, problem solving goal setting, conflict resolution, self-care, um, you name it. We have like a whole No Stress Success series that we run every Wednesday in the library that teaches students these kind of development life skills, things that they just may not know. And, and to no fault, not, not to anyone's fault, they may just not know. They may not know how to handle conflict. Um, and so we offer these um, just as a bonus, I guess, on top of their other classes that they're here to get. Um, but these presentations are typically an hour. Um, and, you know, they're open conversation. It's not like classwork where we give them homework and it's a lecture style. We encourage them to talk back to us. We talk to them. We ask questions. They're usually pretty fun. The students usually, usually participate very well. Um, and at the end of the slides, I will show how your students can get involved with those things. But yeah, so having your student learn those life skills and those coping development skills to help take action. Um, raising awareness, encouraging them to join our outreach services. <laughs> no, you're fine. Encourage them to join our outreach services um, and and come into the different events that we have will also help them. We have the by, bystander intervention, um, increasing um, exposure to the counseling center services so they can get to use get uh, ugh, get used to coming and knowing how it works. Um, so just encouraging your students to do these things and and talking about it and talking to your student about the fact that we have a health and counseling service that I'm going to give you so much information on that on that you're going to be like, oh, I, I didn't know my student had access to all this stuff. They do they have access to so many things um, and really, really, really want them to just take advantage of it. Um, and so, yeah, and and you yourself taking advantage of things. If they see that you're going to suicide prevention or mental health first aid classes, it'll give them a. Uh, understand that oh my parent understands they're on they're trying they're you know they're tr making an attempt to understand what I'm going through or what's going on. That's the next one. Um, so how do you address your student if they are in distress currently? So if your student is in currently in distress, um, one of the things that we encourage if they're on campus and you're on the phone with them and they're in distress. If you can get another phone or even on three-way call um, uh, our Tiger Cares line after hours, they can go, they can call 901 678 2068 option two anytime before 8 a.m. or after 4.30 p.m. Again, I have a slide with the information a little later on. And they can talk to a counselor right then and there. They can we'll have somebody, they can talk to them. And if your students on campus, and they talk to the counselor and the counselor see if they need someone in person, they will reach out to our staff, whoever's on call, will meet up with that person. So we do have services available for your students after hours if you're talking to them and something doesn't seem right. Um, if they are away from campus, and if they're in the state of Tennessee, I know they can log into our DOCSI, our uh, Memphis.edu uh, DOCSI account, which is our telehealth, and they also can talk to someone there. Again, I will have the information later on. You don't have to memorize all that. Um, and so they can get help while they're on campus. So we're, we're, op we're open Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And I tell students this, although our walk-in hours are from 10 to 3, if you are having any kind of emergency, distress, or crisis, you, if our doors are open, you walk into our center or you log into our telehealth um, and, you get, and you get help. Um, so we, we, don't, we don't turn our students away. Um, and so we really want our students to get any kind of help. And if we're unable to help them, we have a case manager who can reach out to the, in the community. She has resources throughout the Shelby County area where she can also send a student if we're unable to assist them. Um, so if you're talking to your student and they are in distress, please, please reach out to the Student Health and Counseling Center. That's the next one. Um, so what gets in the way, again, like we said, we talked about the barriers. We talked about um, the stigma aspect of it that, you know, students typically, if they know that their family or if they know that um, so much has been said negative towards mental health, no, they're, they're not gonna um, 
reach out for help more than likely. Um, other things that can get away is just the barriers of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, of uh, accessing services. Um, and that's a, that's a huge barrier. Fortunately for your students here on campus, they don't have that access issue. If they are a University of Memphis student, we will help them. Um, and so encouraging your students or letting your students know that there's not a barrier access here on campus. Um, they can reach out to the Student Health Center and they can um, get the help that they need. But the thing that you can do as a parent on your end is reduce the stigma. Um, stop thinking of us, try to reduce the negative conversations you have around mental health to make your, your student feel more encouraged um, and feel like there is hope and that they have the support that they need um, to get help. You know, to next slide. No, you can skip that. That was scenarios. Okay. Um, so taking care of yourself um, and how to encourage your student. Again, self-care. Uh, will only improve your work. Encouraging your students to take self-care, um, have a healthier lifestyle, making decisions that will take care of their mental and physical health. I always like the analogy of the when you're on an airplane and they tell you you can't um, put your oxygen mask on before you try to save the next person. Um, it's the same thing. So we try to encourage our students to do self-care and also help them understand that self-care does not mean spending like all this money <laughs> to, to do something to take care of. No, you do not have to go to a $500 spa to do self-care. Uh, self-care could be anything um, to taking a nature walk outside or in the, uh, the library or sitting outside the park and watching the birds. Um, we have so much research has come out recently talking about how nature is so helpful to our mental health. And so we are creating an oasis space over by the counseling center um, where students can come, they can sit and they can just relax for a moment, take their minds off things. Here on campus, your student has two relaxation zones. They have a relaxation zone in Brister and they have one in the UC. And we'll, I'll show you pictures, talk about that a little later on. But the relaxation zone is a place, it's a free place for your students. They've already paid for it. It's, it's, about, it's done. Um, it's a nice uh, place. The students can go sit in the massage chairs. They can do neck massagers. They can just sit there and color if they want. We have coloring. We have the centering stones. They can write on the centering stones. Um, they can make their own stress balls. Um, it's so many things they can do in a relaxation zone. It's in the Brister and it's also in the UC. So it's that we have one that's very accessible to students. But these are some things that your student can do for free. It costs them absolutely nothing. They just show up, sign in, check in, and they can take advantage of those things. So that's one way you can get self care. Like I said, doing the nature walks, going out in nature, walking, watching the birds, things like that can be considered self-care. Reading, if your student loves reading, reading things that are not school involved, a, a personal book that they want to read or an audio book in my case, because I don't have time to actually read. But listening to an audio book or listening to a, or reading a book can be a form of self-care. Sitting in your room and just listening to music can be a form of self-care. So there are so many things that our students can do that can be self-care. And we just need parents to encourage them um, to try these things, um, to just see how it feels, um, just to sit there and sometimes just do nothing. Like literally sit there at the blank wall and just turn your brain off and not think about anything that you have to do. Uh, could be a form of self-care. And again, we also have a presentation on self-care, what it can look like um, that your students can participate in. Uh, model work-life balance for your students. So one of the things we always talk about, oh, is work-life balance, work-life balance. Where if the student has never seen work-life balance, they have no idea what we mean when we say work-life balance. Um, so if you're able to model it for your students and show them, yeah, I do work X amount of hours a week, but also make sure I spend time with my family. I make sure I have my wind down, wind down, down time. Um, I also do self-care. So if your student is seeing these things in their home, um, they know what it is, they understand that. Um, and so they know what work-life balance means. Yes, we can talk to them about work-life balance all day, but if they see it, they know exactly what it is. So I encourage you to, to model that for your students um, and encourage them to take advantage of the resources they do have on campus. So we have a lot of students that, that take a lot of credit hours, like a lot of credit hours, um, and then they work jobs, right? So they, they're taking 
16, 20 credit hours in here working 20, 30 hours a week. And it's like work life balance. What's that? Like all I do is work and work, work and work. That's it. <laughs> um, and so that kind of mentality will spill over into once they graduate and then they'll be doing the same thing. And so we're trying on campus, um, especially where the students that come to the campus center, is encourage them to balance that better. Um, and and stop and take a look. Do you do you need to work 20 or 30 hours a week? Do you need to take 16, 20 credit hours? Um, and 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 see which one of those they can scale back on. And if it's work, then let's scale back on work. You know, since you can't scale back on school because you're trying to graduate in May, I get that. Um, can you scale back on work a little bit? But um, and and with that, if they're unable to do that, finding that that space where they just have time to themselves, like. Okay, fine. You got to work 20, 30 hours. You got to take 16, 20 credit hours. Where is your me time? And helping them carve out a time where it's just for, for them. And they're able to just enjoy the things that they like to do. And so encourage your students to do those things. Uh, another thing, set good boundaries. Um, so a lot of students, they kind of have this connotation that boundaries are only for certain things. I, was, I had to set boundaries in my relationships or my friendships. Now you can set boundaries in everything. Um, and especially for our students that are getting ready to graduate, I really try to encourage them to learn to set boundaries at work because your employer has none. <laughs> and your employer will be like, oh yeah, you can, you can work 12 hours later. It's not going to bother you. And 12 hours tomorrow. Learn how to set those boundaries and, you know, hey, I was hired to work eight. So, you know, um, but teaching your, teaching your students to set good boundaries um, and also Set those boundaries yourself as the authoritative figure in the home um, and showing them what it looks like as a, an employee to set boundaries. Um, turning your work phone off when, when they're home for a summer, um, turn your work phone off and say, hey, you know what? You're here this summer. I'm turning my work phone off at, at six o'clock and that's, and you know, it's our time. So that they can see that, oh, that's possible. <laughs> like mom did and she's not getting fired um and so setting those boundaries and teaching your child teaching your students who set those boundaries also um in different roles in their life um and yes it is still important to set boundaries in relationship settings um but it's just more than just relationship settings where boundaries need to be set so continue to encourage your students to set boundaries um to to stand up for themselves and and say hey no i'm this is this is taking too much out of me I can't give you this much. I can give you this much uh, of my time. And so, like I said, role modeling that as well as teaching that can be helpful. Uh, we are trying our best on our end to encourage students to do that as well. Um, and encourage them to seek help when they're feeling stressed, anxious, or down. Um, your student has so many resources here on campus, like so many. It's, there's a lot of resources here on campus. Um, and so encouraging them to seek out those resources, um, seek out help when they need it. Um, they can literally come to the student. I tell students all the time, I'm, I, I'm in the health center and the counseling center. And I know that, again, it's a barrier for the counseling center because of stigma. Nobody wants to go to the counseling center. But everybody goes to the health center, right? It's like, well, you want to see a nurse practitioner? Like, nobody cares. Um, but I'm like, well, you have resources in the health center. So if you, you know, I tell students, I'm like, if you don't really want to go to the counseling center, I'm like, you come over to the health center. And you tell a nurse practitioner that you're just you're not feeling right, they'll come get me. I'll come in there and talk to you. Um, and if needed, I'll take it to the counseling center myself, or I'll just tell you, you know, how you can join your aunt. Um, and so that kind of also relieves that barrier a little bit because you don't have that, oh, I had to go to the counseling center. I don't want to go to, you know, you're already anxious now. You're like, everybody's gonna see me going to the counseling center. Although, believe it or not, nobody will see you because of where we're located. At. But still, you know, in your mind, you you put that in your head. So we have the health center where you literally can do the same thing and you still can get the help you need it that you need um without having that pressure of worrying about people seeing you going to the counseling center so encourage your students to utilize some of the uh, resources i'll get to in just a moment that they have available to them right here on campus all right so um we like to include these in our slides especially for parents who are away they're not close to your students they don't know what's going on. All you know is your student sounds um, anxious on the phone. They sound like, it sounds like a lot is going on and you don't know what to do. One of the things you can do is you can submit a concern report for your student and they'll have someone reach out to your student and help them. So 
if you don't know anything else, you can go on there, you can submit. If you go to memphis.edu and hit report or concern, it'll um and search for it, it will take you to the site where you can go in and you can submit a report. And so somebody could reach out and help your students. So we truly, truly encourage you to do that. Uh, go to the next slide. All right, so this right here is basically uh, the Dean of Students, their, uh, the concern, different things, uh, different resources that you that your student can have available um, to them if they are concerned about academics, if they're concerned about career services, um, if they're just concerned about their well-being, which is basically goes to our uh, website, um, just different things, resources that you can pass along to your student. You can look over for yourself to be able to talk to your student about it. It's on our Dean of Students site. Next slide. Uh, next slide. That's just our little. <laughs> uh, any questions before I go into our particular resources? Okay. Um, Tiffany, I did want to stop. Uh, we I know we had a question from a parent um that was asking if the university um informs or works with professors so that they can support students who have maybe mental health concerns or challenges do you do you work directly with the professor in working with the student or is that a confidentiality type thing how does that work all right so for us it is a con thank you good question that is a confidentiality thing however if the student is still up with drs we can communicate with the student's permission with DRS. And DRS will share what they need to with the student's permission also with the professor. So that's usually how that does. So if, I, if we have a student um, that their mental health challenge is causing them to um, have problems in their classes, if they're registered with DRS or if not, we will help them get registered with DRS. Um, and once they're Disability Resource Services, but I just keep saying DRS because I'm used to saying it. But once they're registered with uh, Disability Resource Services, um, the student will fill out an ROI for us, a release of information, and we will work with uh, DRS to help make sure the students get the accommodations that they need for their particular class. Um, and then DRS will let the professor know what accommodations. They don't tell the professor what's going on. The professor has no idea what's going on with this student. All the professor knows is that this student needs um, extra time for their deadlines or they need, you know, extra time for a testing um, without sharing why that student needs it. So, yes, we, we do work with DRS pretty closely to make sure our students that are receiving our services get get the help they need. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so I'll, now I go over the service that we offer here at Student Health and Counseling. You can go to the next slide. All right. So our counseling services, I always tell people it's kind of like a mini mental health, uh, community mental health place, because we see everything and we have just about everything you will find in a community mental health place, space, right? Uh, we do individual therapy. We do group therapy, couples, partners, roommates, friends. We'll do family counseling. Career counseling, we do do um, some assessments and evaluation, but there is a fee to that. Um, we also have access to a psychiatrist who does medication services as well as telehealth and in-person services. Um, and so everything that we offer, um, there's no charge for it. However, for assessment and evaluation, there is a fee. We always let the student know up front if you need learning disabilities or ADHD or personality testing, any kind of testing like that, let them know, hey, there's going to be a fee for this up front, um, and we'll tell you exactly how much it is. The fees vary. Um, and I know sometimes DRS has an assistant program to help them if the student can't afford it. Um, I think they run out of money pretty quickly, so you have to do it, like, really early on. Um, but other than that, there is no charge for our services, and you can come in person, or you can do it via telehealth, um, whichever works for you. On our team, we have psychologists, we have doc doctoral psychology interns, and these are basically interns in their last year of school. So they're like basically about to graduate and be four doctors. Um, and so we have those, we have four doctoral psych interns, we have licensed clinical social workers and social workers, and we also have doctoral and master level student therapists. And these are students who are usually in their second or third year of graduate school um, for master level students. They're in their second year, I think the final semester last year, last two semesters. 
um, and for our doctoral, they're usually in that second year before they go into the doctoral psych intern. The point I'm making is they are they're skilled at what they do. Um, we train them. Um, we are always senior staff is always ready or available for consultation for any student. So you get real services. You get um, the same thing you would get in the community health um, center. All right, next slide. All right, so getting set up for students. Um, basically, all they have to do is uh, meet with our admin, admin staff and they'll complete like some paperwork. And once they complete the uh, paperwork, our admin staff will assign them to a therapist just for a brief session. The therapist will talk to them, meet them, see what's going on, and then make the best clinical decision about what that student needs. If the student needs to continue on with one-on-one -on -one therapy, they will assign them to a therapist based on their level. If the student needs couple therapy, they'll, you know, find a therapist that does couples. If they need to go to one of our groups, they'll submit them for one of our groups. And if the student didn't need anything, they just need to sit there and they were fine. They're like, don't want another appointment. Um, they'll do that. Um, but whatever the clinical judgment is, they'll set them up for the oh, excuse me, next step and they'll go ahead and set their appointment. So they'll leave out of that office knowing what their next steps are. Is if it's either come back and see a therapist or go into group or whatever it is, they'll get all that in the first session. If you can't come in person, like I said, we have telehealth on our website. Same process. They'll fill out the paperwork and they'll meet with a therapist. Now, sometimes we have students that um, come in with a crisis, meaning that they're situ they are in adamant distress. And they need help right away. So in those situations, they don't complete all that paperwork. We get basic information and they go in and see a therapist right then and there. Um, there are also times where we have to, um, we also, we have to send a student in for, you know, further evaluation at one of the local uh, facilities. We, right now we use, we're contracted with Crestwind. Uh, and so we may have to have our student transported if we see they're in uh, immediate danger to themselves or to others. Um, we will do that. Uh, fortunately, we cannot tell the parents unless your student gives us permission and do an ROI and say, yes, tell you know, call my mom or call my father or call whoever and let them know um, what's going on. Same thing with Crestwind. If they get there and they tell Crestwind to you know, call my family, they will. Other than that, it's confidential. And unfortunately, we can't. We can't share it with the families. I know sometimes families get a little upset with us about it, but um, we, can't, we can't cross their trust with the student. We, we are bound by confidentiality in our department. And our goal is to get your students somewhere safe immediately and just know that's what we will do. Okay, we can go to the next slide. All right, so getting services. Again, we're located at 214 Wilder Tower. I always tell students it's the tallest occupiable building on campus. I have to say occupiable because somebody wants to argue me that the clock is taller. I don't think it is, but you know, I don't argue with him anymore. I'm like, well, it's, it's only when it's occupied. You can't occupy the clock. Um, so we're located in the second floor on Wilder Tower, room 214. We're open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. During fall and spring, we do offer even hours. Uh, we do have Monday, Tuesday, I think every day except Friday, we have somewhere there, someone there until 6 or 6.30. Um, and so we do have evening hours that's on, if that's the only thing that works for a student's schedule. We try to work with the students. Again, walk-in hours um, for in-person or virtual is Monday through Friday, 10 to 3. And this is for any new client who wants to get set up with services or a client who was a client who hadn't been there, you know, three or four semesters who want to start back up. They can come in or go virtual from 10 to 3. And like I said, if you are having a crisis or any kind of emergency situation and you need to get seen sooner, if we're if the doors are open, come in, hit that little bell, nobody's up there um, and we will um, uh, see you. Um, our after hours emergency crisis line is Tiger Care Line is 678-2068, option two. So if your student is in distress and it's after 430 or on the weekend, they can call that number. They can talk to somebody right away. Um, uh, without waiting. And like I said, if there's a situation where police services or our staff need to go out there, that'll happen as well. But usually our Tiger Care line can really take care of it and there's no need until they come in next day. If you go to memphis.edu backslash counseling, that's where you can find our telehealth services. Um, and it'll just tell you to join the waiting room and someone will take care of you from there. 
Our health center that I was talking about also open Monday through Friday from 8 to 4.30. Um, we do take appointments, but we have some limited walk-in hours. Um, our walk-in hours are Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 8 a.m. to 10, and Tuesdays from 9 a.m. Uh, to 10 a.m. I'm sorry, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Fridays from 8 to 10. Um, and so we do have some walk-in hours, and like I said, if you're a student, um, just feeling like they're in a little distress, and they would rather come to the health center than go to the counseling center. If they go in and just say, you know, hey, I need to talk to the social worker. They'll they'll usually call me if I'm in the counseling center or find me and I'll come over here and talk to them. Um, but we really, really want them to go to the counseling center and just really encourage them to go to the counseling center or just call the number or go into telehealth. Um, and so that way they don't have to wait at all because I'm only here on the health center Tuesdays and Wednesdays where I'm here all day. So, you know, outside of those days, um, it's so much better for me just to go to the counseling center. And here's our information for our relaxation zone. Your student knows where Brister and UC are. Um, so they can go to Brister 302 or they can go to the UC second floor um, to go to the relaxation zone. And those are the hours that we have right now. And you can go to the next slide. All right, so here's just a little bit more information. I like how we put the QR codes. Well, I guess if you're looking on your computer, you can scan it from your phone. Uh, so you can go to, the, uh, to those QR codes. Um, Scan those QR codes, or you can just go to the memphis.edu backslash SHCS, and you can get to all of our information on all of our, uh, across our websites. Uh, so this is a little bit more information about the relaxation zone that I was telling you about your students have access to. They have the myo, uh, massage chairs. Biofeedback is offline right now, so we're not even going to talk about that. Uh, but they do have stress relief coloring, Zen Garden, stress ball creation. Oh, the Buddha boards, positivity boards, center and stones. Um, and we have group programming, uh, get to relax on. So students, um, your professor sometimes will um, request that you have a, a field trip, what I call it, to a relaxation zone where they can, um, they'll go in, they have like a little program and, and the students get to basically try everything that's in the relaxation zone. All the students love the massage chairs. All the faculty and staff love the massage chairs. We do have faculty and staff days sometimes. Um, so everybody loves the massage chairs. They're really nice. I've said them before. I, yeah, they're nice. Um, but your student does have access to that. And so we really encourage them um, to check it out. It's it's a nice place to just relax and just ease your mind. You can go to the next slide. Um, so your student can reach us on all of our social media platforms. Um, this is where we put all of our uh, events, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'm happy they found it to TikTok off because we don't have TikTok anymore. Um, but we do have a podcast and we put different podcasts. Um, I think we're trying to do like at least once a month. Right now we have one that's, um, what does my hair have to do with? Talking about um, Black women and their hair in the professional culture and the professional workspace, uh, which is a really good one. But we always have uh, different things on our social media event, uh, sites. Our Tiger Zone Mobile, which we don't have up here. All your students have access to Tiger Zone Mobile. We encourage them to download Tiger Zone Mobile because we post all of our events on Tiger Zone. There we go. We post all of our events on Tiger Zone and the students are able to RSVP for it. Um, but if you have the app, whenever we have something, we always post the day of just to remind you. And it kind of like goes out to everybody everywhere. I don't know. I just know a lot of students show up to stuff and they're like, yeah, I saw on Tiger Zone Mobile. <laughs> it works. Um, so if your student wants to know where we're going to be at, what kind of event we're going to be hosting, I encourage them to um, go to Tiger Zone Mobile um, to get more information. Another thing is, um, I'll get with Heather, if you ever want to offer a Talk Sage Live presentation or a mental health first aid presentation for your parents that are here, because it's kind of hard for us to do it virtually. So if you ever have any parents that are in Memphis or they happen to be here on campus or whatever, event that's going on they would like to do any of those classes to learn a little bit more on how they can support their student um in the mental health crisis we we will be glad to do that programming uh, for you guys and so that you can learn you know how to address and deal with situations as they occur so the opportunity is also there that, that might be something that we could uh incorporate into parent and family weekend because we do get a lot of parents to come to campus so um okay. parents, sound off uh we want to provide the services that you're looking for and this will be a good one so yeah yeah it, it, it really is the talk save live is suicide prevention it's only an hour long um so that's a short one the mental first mental health first aid training 
they have we have one that's a full day, but we also have one that's blended that's like four hours. Our goal is to test the four hour one this summer with our faculty and staff. And if it goes well, we'll be able to offer them. <laughs> Um, so we're going to test with faculty and staff and see how well the four-hour one goes. Uh, but um, if they're interested, let us know. We can carve out for either the four-hour one or the one-hour one so the student, the parents can also learn more about um, ways of recognizing crisis and how to deal with them. So, yeah, so that's totally an option. All right, you can go to the next one. Uh, so um, these are some of the things that your student can get involved with. They want to get involved with us. Um, we have a recovery uh, coalition. We also have a student wellness and advisory board. Uh, we do undergrad internships and practicum internships. So if your student's looking for an internship, if they want to go into psychology or social work or counseling or anything like that, we do offer internships. Um, grant, our undergrad mostly work out RZ, but we're also starting to incorporate them a lot by outreach programming. So they can go do table in advance. Um, if their schedule allows, they come with us to some of our um, speaking engagements. So we're trying to get your students to get a real, if they're going to that field, to get a real feel of everything that kind of goes with it um, and different things that they can do. So I encourage your students to um, reach out to us and, and get involved. You can go to the next one. All right. And if you get a chance, you can do this survey. Take Victoria's name off of it and just say Tiffany because Victoria did. So she had an emergency, so she had to step out on me. Uh, but if you get a chance, you can do this uh, survey for us just to know if we're presenting things that are useful to the community. And that's it. Thanks for being part of the U of M family. <laughs> all right. Well, we want to thank you for all that wonderful information. Uh, parents, I hope that you were um, informed and that something that Tiffany said really struck with you as it relates to how you support your student, um, having a stigma free home and, and being able to ask those questions and be engaged with your students so that they can get the help that they need when they need it. So we appreciate you, Tiffany, for uh, sharing all that wonderful information. Um, again, if you need to um, need us to reiterate any of those contacts or anything, feel free to reach out to us at parents at memphis.edu. Um, but we'll be reposting a lot of what um, the counseling center and the health center posts, um, just because we feel like it's things that are important to families as you support your student. We wanna make sure you have the tools that you need. Um, these are some of our upcoming activities right now we're in final care packages pickup time so we're in the university center actually doing a collaboration with the relaxation zone um, where students can come and pick up their care packages if you've purchased one for them they can come today until four o'clock and also wednesday april 17th from 9 a.m to 4 p.m as well um, again, the relaxation zone is located in the University Center on the second floor, right inside of the student involvement zone. And we've got a table set up and students have been coming and picking up their packages. And when they see those notes that you all have written them, they've got smiles on their faces. And a few of them have actually gone into the relaxation zone. They've never been in there. And a couple of people, they were still in there when we left. So <laughs> hopefully they're not skipping classes, but they seem to have found some good activities that, that are helping them to relax and knowing that they have this place there and this resource available to them um, is great. Also, if you have a student graduating May of 2024, we have graduation yard signs for, for sale. Uh, you can purchase one of them through our office. Uh, we'll be set up during cap and gown distribution on May 2nd and 3rd from 9 to 4, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. in the University Center ballroom. So as they pick up their cap and gown, they can also pick up a, a yard sign that you can display in your yard to show the world how proud you are of your Memphis Tiger graduate. <laughs> so we invite you to um be a part of these events and services and again thank you for attending thank you tiffany for your wonderful information and for taking the time out to talk with our families until the next tiger talk which will likely be in the summer we are planning some summer tiger talk so stay tuned for those please follow us on uh, youtube uh, check our website out and follow us on our uh, social media channels instagram and Twitter slash X, <laughs> and uh, we'll give you more information about when those Tiger Talks will happen and what the topics are going to be. But we thank you for attending, and we'll see you on the next Tiger Talk. Have a wonderful day.